very good morning to everyone to this 17th episode of Breakfast at UN Health. I am Prof. Prismawati, consultant hepatologist, and we are deeply honoured to have with us today from the team from the University of New Mexico to explore opportunities for collaboration and also expand access to cancer care, particularly to rural and underserved communities across Malaysia. So I think most of you, as you know about Project ECHO, and without doubt, ECHO, which stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, has transformed medical education and significantly increased the workforce capacity to provide specialised care and reduce health disparities. So it gives me utmost pleasure to introduce the first speaker for this morning, Professor Sanjeev Arora who is the founder and director of Project ECHO and distinguished professor of medicine in the University of New Mexico. Professor Aurora is both a hepatologist and social entrepreneur who have worked very hard to save lives and create life-changing innovative solutions to major gaps in healthcare. And I must actually mention about one of Professor Aurora's most outstanding achievements, which include the 2021 Laureate or the Brock Prize in Education Innovation, which built upon the belief that most, the most important thing we do in life is to educate the next generation. Now, this prize reward ideas proven to enhance education with global impact, universal accessibility, and a proven track record, which very much summarized what the ECHO model is all about. Now, I'd like to invite Professor Aurora to give an overview and update on Project ECHO. Let's welcome Professor Aurora. Well, thank you, Professor, and thank you for, first of all, bringing ECHO to the University of Malaya. Thank you for all you have done to grow it here. So the purpose of my uh, talk today will be asking you a question, and that is, we know that about 78% of Malaysians get their health care through the public health system here. And 22% have private insurance. To our study is have a significant difficulties in accessing good specialty care. They have significant difficulty in accessing highly specialized knowledge. You have a very distributed country uh, with many islands. And so the question I'm going to ask all of you is, could the ECHO model be used to create more equitable health outcomes for every Malaysian in the public health system? And that's going to be the focus of my talk. It's going to be more of a question. And I would like your inputs in the end. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a gastroenterologist like you, Professor, and um, a hepatologist. And in, in 2001, I had gone to my clinic at the University of New Mexico. And I saw a 43-year-old woman there. And I asked her, how can I help you? She had a 14-year-old boy and a 9-year-old girl in the room with her. And she said, I have hepatitis C and I want treatment. And I said, uh, how long have you had it? And she told me, you know, she had used drugs at very, very early in her age, and but eight years earlier she had been diagnosed. And uh, so I said, why did you not come earlier for treatment? We have a potential treatment here. And she said, I called your nurse and there was an eight-month wait to see you. And she told me that the treatment was these weekly injections and pills which I would have to take. And this was, um, I'm a single mother and I just couldn't make 12 trips like that, take so much time off work. So I said, why did you come today? She said, I'm having pain here in the right upper side of my abdomen. And I did an ultrasound. And to my surprise, because liver cancer typically doesn't occur this young in a woman, she had a cancer about that large. And it was too large for a liver transplant or essentially she passed away six months later leaving these two children and I was asking why did she die of a disease that could have been prevented and and the answer was she died because the right knowledge didn't exist at the right place at the right time and she didn't have the ability 
to get to the right knowledge. And that's really the challenge I was facing. There were 28,000 hepatitis C patients who had been diagnosed with um, hepatitis C in New Mexico. New Mexico is a large state with about 2 million people in the US. And there were 28,000 names the Department of Health had, but uh, only 1,500 had been treated. So I was trying to figure out how do I get treatment to everyone? And then if I could do that, we'd have a model for complex disease in rural locations. And it is based on four key ideas. There was no Zoom at that time. And so we bootstrapped a solution which looked like Zoom, one-to-many video conferencing. The second key idea was to share best practices. So I went around the state of New Mexico and I set up 21 new treatment sites for hepatitis C in rural areas of New Mexico in primary care settings. And I gave them my protocol, but they said, we can't do this. This is a chemotherapy-like regimen of interferon ribavirin. And they said, you know, this is a little too dangerous for us to do. We haven't done fellowships in hepatology like uh, professor. And so I asked myself, how did you become an expert in treating hepatitis C? So when I did my fellowship in Boston, in Massachusetts, I would see a patient present to my professor, see another one present to my professor. And after two years, they said, you're a gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. I said, aha, I'm going to use this model to create new hepatitis Cologists in New Mexico without them having to leave their town, go for residency or fellowship. They won't be hepatologists, but they could become hepatitis Cologists through a process which we call case-based learning. And the idea being, if you want to teach your daughter to drive a car, you can't just give her lectures on driving a car. You do guided practice until they go from novice to intermediate expert to expert. And then we would evaluate and monitor outcomes. So the first echo looked like this. It looks diff slightly different from Zoom, where all 21 would join. And in the big box is a psychiatrist, a pharmacist, and me. And then one by one, they would present patients of hepatitis C to me. So it was always at a fixed time, Wednesday, 3 to 5 p.m. We would discuss about eight patients and 15 minutes, I'd give them a lecture. As I did this week after week, I found in one year, they became great experts. And in 18 months, the wait in my clinic fell from eight months to two weeks. That essentially is the reason I'm in here in Malaysia. Can we do this? for a lot of different diseases uh, in Malaysia. So everybody gets better care and can we do this at scale? Um, so about 15 minutes of the two hours was a lecture. So this is not telemedicine at the bottom where a specialist helps a patient in blue, but this is a capacity building tool where, multiple, where the team of experts trains teams who then go and help hundreds and possibly many more patients. The first thing we had to study was self-efficacy because remember they said this was chemo-like regimen, they didn't feel comfortable. So one, I have no skill. Seven, I'm an expert who can teach others. So we asked them, what's your ability to treat hepatitis C it goes from two to 5.2 in 12 months. Can you now become a local consultant? Remember there are about a few thousand doctors in New Mexico. We didn't train all of them, we just trained 21. They had to accept referrals from everybody else in their local community, 2.4 to 5.6. So essentially, first they treated their own patients, then their local office, and then everybody in the town started going to them first. And overall competence went from 2.8 to 5.5. And one surprising finding was we found that ECHO was producing joy of work for them. It was diminishing their professional isolation, 4.3 out of 5, enhancing their professional satisfaction and expanding access to HCV. We, we realized that people were hungry for community, but all of this didn't in itself make a big difference until we published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we published a lead article there where we compared the outcomes of primary care doctors and nurse practitioners giving interferon ribavirin treatment in rural areas and prisons compared it to the university. And we showed that rural primary care clinicians can do it as safely and effectively 
and that we can improve access to care for minorities. This was a game changer, this paper for us. It, it comes out in the middle of the night when I got up in the morning. I had emails in my box saying, hey, we want to replicate this model for diabetes. We want to replicate it for rheumatology and so on and so forth, for epilepsy. So now our mission is not to do with hepatitis C. Our mission is to democratize the implementation of best practices for healthcare and education to underserved people all over the world. And what's the problem is that advances in health are not reaching people equitably. And about 6 billion people in the world don't have access to the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. That's the problem. Our goal is to touch the lives of 1 billion people. We have already, we believe, improved the lives of 200 million people in the world. So we still have a long way to go. And so in the beginning, we said, okay, we could, now what should we do? First, we said we can apply it for many diseases. So we said, okay, if it's a common disease with complex management, new treatments, high societal impact, then you could use it. Could it be epilepsy? Could it be rheumatoid arthritis? Could it be complex diabetes? And in New Mexico, we started trying it for many, many, many disease areas like substance use and mental health, now long COVID, the cancer, diabetes. And in New Mexico alone, with just 2 million people, we run 28 echo networks in healthcare and 19 in education because we realized that School teachers have the same issue. They don't have access to best practice. So can we upskill them in literacy and math and science and so on and so forth so that students in rural areas get a better education? Currently, we have ECHO going on for um, about 70 disease areas all over the world uh, and diseases like um, antimicrobial stewardship, autism, behavioral health, bone health, cancer, diabetes. I talked about education. And we have about four to 5,000 networks operating in the world right now for all these disease areas. And our dream is that we'll have all 70 going on in Malaysia at some point with the University of Malaya leading the way, partnering with the Ministry of Health to use this as a model for upskilling the workforce in rural um, Malaysia. I can't see of any other entity in Malaysia taking on this responsibility. The goal is force multiplication, where if you have a nurse practitioner or a specialist uh, providing the same level of care as a specialist, you get 10 times capacity expansion. So we are talking about exponential growth in the ability to deliver best practice. The other aspect of this is we don't use ECHO just to train doctors and nurse practitioners. We have programs for community health workers, for medical assistants, for nurses, upskilling them in a major way on the most important problems of society. So what are the benefits of the ECHO model? Our improved quality safety, rapid learning and best practice dissemination, reducing variation in care, improving access for underserved patients, the workforce training and force multiplier effects, improving professional satisfaction, supporting medical homes, cost effective care by avoiding excessive testing and travel. But really, what the key underlying thesis here is if a University of Malaya decides that they want to democratize implementation of their best practices, I'm not talking about democratizing knowledge because even Google does that. And now chat GPT will do that even more. We're talking about democratizing implementation. So holding the hands of these clinicians so they go from novice to expert. So currently we have 530 peer reviewed publications. We get two, we get two, we get two new publications demonstrating the effectiveness of ECHO every single week now. So I made this slide just uh, six, seven weeks ago. It was 5.50, now it's 5.30. Now, of course, satisfaction, joy of work, three and three publications, their knowledge increased 244, but the real critical publications start from changes to practice. So there are 126 peer-reviewed publications showing 
that you can look at an electronic medical record and you can show that these doctors and nurse practitioners have adopted best practice. So it's not just that they've learned, they are changing their behavior. 74 publications now showing that patient health outcomes improve and eight publications showing that the health of the community improves if you use ECHO. So the, the issue then came us, uh, for us, my, my colleague here, Dr. Elizabeth Cluett, leads uh, our initiative in replication of ECHO. She's been doing that for nine years and a, a lot of this work is her success. So we said to get to a billion, how do we do it? We said we will democratize the implementation of ECHO and give it to any university. By now we have the worldwide Zoom license we acquired from the founder of Zoom. We've given out thousands and thousands of Zoom licenses, all of African continent, all of India works on our Zoom licenses. And we started training other universities in the United States. And right now, every major university in the US, from Harvard to Stanford to Johns Hopkins to MD Anderson, UCSF, U Chicago, Yale, they all do Echo now. And there's one concept I wanted to tell you. We have a concept called super hubs, which I'll talk about in a moment. Every part, this is what we want to do to Malaysia. If you're light blue, you're a rural area. If you're dark blue, you're an urban area. Almost all zip codes in the United States currently have echo learners. Now imagine if we did that in Malaysia, what a big impact it could have. So globally now, we have 1,004 hubs. They are all over the world. And you can see there's uh, some in Malaysia. But here's the thing that there are some things here which are not orange circles. They are these hexagons. These are called super hubs. We have 38 of them. I'm hoping one day, Professor, that you will take the University of Malaya to become a super hub. What does a super hub do? We give you the right to create new hubs. So we would need a couple of hundred hubs just for Malaysia in different disease areas. In, in all aspects, let's say for cancer. And so let me give you an example for Africa. We have 14 ministries of health that have deployed ECHO already in Africa. Just since April 2020, we have launched 177 new hubs just in Africa for diverse diseases like HIV, TB, COVID-19, antimicrobial resistance, cancer, etc. Look at the attendance in Africa and India. In India, just since April 20, 828,000 attendances. In Africa, 664,000. Our goal in, in Africa is to train 2 million healthcare providers and improve lives of 300 million people across Africa over the next five years. So let me give you an example. Oh, this is a study done by the US government. Um, they were training HIV doctors in Malaysia, in um, Western Kenya. And what they showed was it was costing them $820 to train one doctor. It went down to $20.96 and it was better. What they had done was they were training three days once a year. We call that the flood the farm system. Echo is a drip irrigation system of farming where you are dripping the knowledge, helping them adopt it. And so you can reduce the cost dramatically of workforce training. And this is Latin America ministries of health. This is India. You can see the rapid growth of hubs in India is continuing at the pace. Now we have 275 hubs in India with more than 800,000 attendances in diverse problems like COVID, TB, palliative care, cancer, maternal health, and so on. Here is an example of scale. This is a state in northern India called Punjab, where basically the major institute called Postgraduate Institute Chandigarh was treating 1500 patients per year of hepatitis C. They adopted ECHO. They published in the European Journal of Hepatology um, that they had a 91% cure rate in these 
rural hospitals and now have tr treated more than 120,000 patients this way. Um, all the major national programs in India run on ECHO now, national TB, viral hepatitis, primary care, national cancer screening, and mental health program. This is one of our hopes for the Ministry of Health, and um, we're really looking forward to the opportunity to meeting them to see how they can use ECHO to improve care in the public health system of Malaysia. Um, overall, so far, we have 4.4 million attendances in 193 countries. So every UN member country has ECHO learners right now. And it's growing exponentially, as you can see. One of the key interest areas for us is opportunity to improve cancer care. We have echoes related to the entire continuum of cancer care from smoking cessation, HPV vaccination, HBV, sun safety, dermatology, breast, cervical, oral. Uh, all these have different echoes, pain and toxicity management, cancer care navigation, precision medicine, palliative care. And of course, you have those here, health promotion, caregivers, etc. So these are all the cancer hubs that we have in the world just specifically focused on cancer so let's look at this this is md anderson the the biggest cancer center in the world they do echo as does memorial sloan kettering but they run 20 echo networks for gynecological head and neck tobacco cessation early detection of melanoma etc this is American Cancer Society that also runs more than 20 ECHO projects for HPV vaccination, L LGBTQ health, and uh, biomarker testing, tobacco cessation, colorectal lung cancer. This is the National Cancer Institute in Washington, DC. They run ECHOs and of course, Malaysia participates in that. Um, uh, the Malaysian Cancer Society is a spoken learner here and these are very successful echoes run by the u.s government many many publications in cancer overall we have 71 peer-reviewed publications just to demonstrate that cancer care improves if you uh, use echo you've got some publications overall 175 cancer related hubs 550 networks more than 100,000 attendances. So in India, the major Tata Memorial Cancer Center, many, many cancer, these are all cancer centers in India using ECHO for cancer control. 250 oncology programs running um, at one time. This is our training of community health workers now for cancer care navigators and detection, early detection of cervical and breast cancer. Echo in Indonesia with Dharmai National Cancer Center, Breast Cancer Foundation. This is um, many more echoes in Indonesia. We can also use echo for nurse oncology training, training cancer patient care navigators. In Vietnam, we have a big presence. We have a team located there. And you can see we have more than 20 hubs and we also have a super hub in Hanoi at the Vietnam National Children's Hospital. This is my meeting with the Minister of Health and I tried my best to meet here with the Minister, but I understand you have a new one. It was not successful, but I met with the Minister in Vietnam and the first thing that came out of his mouth was, can you please set up 100 hubs for me in non-communicable diseases. That was the very first thing and we promised to do that. Um, so I have to say one thing, none of this would have been possible without Professor Rosmavati. She is a game changer and um, I, I had the extreme pleasure and honor to meet her. And you can see what she has done with her leadership and the collaboration of, with the global um, international department who have supported her, you now have seven ECHO projects going out for, for liver HCC, palliative care, Dr. Lung, um, gynecological oncology, head and neck, 
Asian breast surgery. But I have to admit, we have barely scratched the surface. We can change healthcare in Malaysia. I am confident of it. And I need your help to do that in everything that goes on here. You have a great, great country, the more, one of the most beautiful countries I've visited. And Dr. Elizabeth Kluwet, who is my traveling companion and my chief of staff, uh, the first thing that came out of her mouth after a few um, hours here and said, I have to bring my family here for vacation. And, and you can see there are other programs here, um, Malaysian Hospice Council, and we talked about this, of course. And in the cancer space, you can see these are the goals of your country. This is the Mas Malaysian National Strategic Plan for Cancer. So you can improve cervical cancer. And we want to reduce, improve the five-year survival rate of these cancers. And we want to reduce mortality. And we want to align with the government so that we can help them meet their priorities in colorectal, breast, cervical, etc. This is, <laughs> I'll skip this in the interest of time. But the four guiding principles of all ECHO projects are equity. We bring equity by bringing agency and expertise at the front line. We, we develop that through our ECHO model of guided practice, all teach, all learn, and enable organizations like the University of Malaya and the Ministry of Health to achieve their mission with speed, scale, fidelity, and at low cost. And winding down, what makes ECHO work is team-based care. Task shifting is the idea of every human being working at the highest level of their human potential. This requires interprofessional consultation, guided practice, and mentor-mentee relationships. ECHO also pr produces social networks. It produces joy of work. But the key driver of ECHO is this idea called all teach, all learn. That the ministries of health or University of Malaya don't have all the expertise to implement best practice. But learning from the learners about their social circumstances, their culture, their economic constraints, and bringing that into the solutions that you produce, that is what produces best practice and new knowledge gets created. So I want to show you a new platform. One of the challenges we've always had with ECHO is the data tracking. It takes time. We have created a new iEcho platform, which will reduce the cost, human cost of tracking all this data by about 70, 80%. A person has to just join once your learner, and then this software will track their lifelong journey of learning. It will offer digital certification. Let's say you say you have to attend 15 palliative care echoes, then present four cases, and then take a written test. It will allow you to administer tests within the platform. The Zoom will be embedded in it. It has advanced data analytics in it. Uh, we have just added um, the chat GPT like AI technology in it. I'm going to show you uh, just a three minute video. It's highly secure. And the other thing about it is that it allows you to really evaluate your projects with much greater ease than you would otherwise do. So I don't know if there's a way I can show this video now. Asynchronous I'm, I'm, enhancement of the ECHO model to transform learning outcomes at scale. Yes. Oh, thank you. Meet Dr. Shoba, a TB doctor based out of Andhra Pradesh, India. A patient with a complex case of TB visits her clinic and she is unsure of how to treat him. A colleague refers her to Project ECHO. She downloads the iEcho app and signs up to join the movement. iEcho analyzes her information and prompts her to take a short quiz on TB to assess her knowledge level. Based on her professional background and knowledge level, iEcho suggests her to join the introduction to TB management ECHO program conducted by the National Institute of TB. Shoba takes part in weekly interactive ECHO sessions with national experts and learns about best practices in TB management. She presents the complex case of her patient to the panel and gets expert guidance. iEcho, powered with a Porva AI technology, analyzes the case and finds a similar case from South Africa. 
Shoba uses I Echo to connect with the doctor from South Africa who presented that case and gets additional perspectives on her patient. She applies her learnings from the Echo sessions and treats her patient successfully. In addition to the live learning sessions, Shoba uses the iEcho Discussions Forum to interact with her community to continue the learning asynchronously. She accesses asynchronous learning videos and reading materials at her convenience. She is prompted by iEcho to join the global TB Echo community of over 50,000 TB professionals from around the world. She interacts with the global community, and her knowledge further improves with access to global best practices. Through the global community, Shoba comes to know of an advanced course on TB management to further enhance her knowledge. She completes this advanced course and receives a digital certificate from iEcho and a badge to certify her as an expert in TB management. As a verified expert, she now creates her own Echo program in her native Telugu language to build capacity in the villages of Andhra Pradesh. Over time, Apoorva AI analyzes trends in patient cases being presented on the Echo network and sees an uptick in a special type of drug-resistant TB cases being reported in a particular district. This information is highlighted to public health authorities to take action. This revolutionary innovation of the ECHO model will offer great benefits to learners, experts, and the community at large. Imagine a trusted human network of 20 million first-mile professionals like Dr. Shoba, empowered with artificial intelligence to improve community outcomes and build a society resilient to future pandemics. So I thank you. I think we're going to stop this now. And, uh... We can play a YouTube movie now. <laughs> so I will see how we can stop it sharing. All right. Thank you. I wanted to just um, open it up for questions or any other comments other people have. Okay. Yeah. We will keep that to later. Okay. Um, so um, thank you very much. That was very inspiring. I'm very excited about iEcho. I think there are very many potential, including tra tracking all our trainee sessions. Okay, so let's move, switch gears now and highlight the, some of the ECHO projects in the University of Malaya, or rather started by teams, champions from the University of Malaya. And I'll start the ball rolling very quickly. I need that um, to share. Okay, so we will try to be brief um, in view of the time here, but I think we will have another session for some of us for the discussions later anyway. So let's see how I can share screen. Let me be very first. Following the inspiring Professor Aurora's visit in the World Cancer Congress, we had signed the University of New Mexico. And the goal of replicating Project Echo in Malaysia, as stated here, is to build capacity via telementoring of healthcare professionals to provide best practice care. So I will just highlight very briefly that we first used the Echo model to catalyze priority actions for uh, HCC and by enabling access to a case-based discussion uh, MDT approach to HCC and at the same time we started the liver echo to improve knowledge and early detection of common liver disease including HCC. So the, uh, more recently we've also uh, are trying to optimize HCC prevention and early detection by scaling up the detection of HCC risk factors, and that is by using the screening for fatty liver in type 2 diabetes according to the CTG. So what ha ha happened was the weekly liver GI MDT sessions were ongoing for more than 15 years in UMMC focusing on HCC, and we had turned totally virtual since before the pandemic. And that was very timely because we were able to continue this MDT discussion unabated during the pandemic. So this weekly session uses a case-based discussion template as described by Professor Aurora. And this template was also now has been used to two other centers in Malaysia. And now we have actually initiated discussion with the National Cancer Registry to use these data collection that we have to strengthen what we have for HCC, which is currently um, uh, lacking. 
So we had the liver aqua sessions initially monthly together with the Ministry of Health with Dr. Tan Tzu Siam from Selayang. And very recently this year, it has now turned weekly by just sharing the regular teaching sessions at the various centres, the biggest centres across Malaysia, including Sabah, uh, USM, and also ACTM, UKM. And really, this has been very helpful for, for trainees, not just for internal medicine, but also for gastro trainees. And this is something which is what we are working on now. Now, the inclusion of screening for fatty liver disease in the clinical practice guidelines in type 2 diabetes has really provided an opportunity to place fatty liver on the radar of primary care providers uh, and other clinicians as well, including endocrinologists. And when we actually have this certification, which is also included in the CPG, we're now able to actually identify those at risk of HCC. And why this has become so important is because we have data to show that this is going to be rapidly replacing hepatitis B as the commonest cause of liver cancer in Malaysia because, unfortunately, of the expanding waist circumference of our population. So we've also looked at this opportunity to actually screen for other risk factors because, as you know, as when we actually uh, want to identify fatty liver disease or rather diagnose fatty liver due to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we also have to screen for hepatitis B and C. But I think the more important reason to actually highlight this is the echo model is not just about task sharing. And I think one of the things that we have learned, the differentiated care strategy has provided better linkage to care and to know who to refer rather than swamp the tertiary hospitals with the referrals. So this is another milestone uh, at the 14 Ministry of Health Academy Medicine meeting last year. We've actually had four associations actually commit to uh, confirm or affirm their commitment to disseminate the recommendations from the CPG in the primary care setting. And we're not just talking about the type 2 diabetes, but other CPGs under the Ministry of Health. So discussions are on, ongoing on how to best do that. And this is again looking at what we had started using a model by decentralizing identification, those at risk for HCC in the community using the ECHO model. But before we can do that, you really need to engage the local clinicians and in this uh, aspect, also the camp path. Uh, and we've done that in three states across Malaysia. And these are states with no access to fiber scan because actually mm. at the moment in the public health setting, the number of fiber scan is less than the fingers of one hand. So we mm. actually use this simple blood-based biomarker to really help to identify those at risk for HCC using this model. So this is something that you need to do first and find out, identify what are the challenges in this before we can go on using uh, a, a better way to use the ECHO model. So I'll stop there. And I will pass the mic now to Prof Aisha. Prof Aisha, are you online? Oops. Sorry. Yes. Okay, sorry. I can't get this to stop oh, working. <laughs> How do I stop this? Okay, we are, yeah. Okay, I'll sharing. share my, my slides. Okay, go ahead. So um, let me introduce Prof. Aisha. She's actually a consultant breast surgeon here, and she's also head of the uh, Cancer Institute in UM. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Prof. Aurora. I think we were all um, inspired by your talk, I think, at the World Cancer Congress back um, 2018. So, University Malaya Cancer Research Institute is uh, really focusing on uh, uh, population health at the moment, where we feel that we should be really pushing the agenda of having quality care, cancer care, as well as um, um, damaging of cancers in um, our country. And we also have another project where we will be introducing um, recent developments um, where doctors need to implement mainstreaming of genetic testing in cancer. So these are the three projects that I thought I'd share today. Um, so the first one is a partnership that we have with the City Cancer Challenge where one of the projects that came about from this uh, City Cancer Challenge is the multidisciplinary 
approach and standardization of care for breast cancer. So we have uh, uh, completed almost this project. Um, and uh, just a little bit of background, uh, CD Cancer Foundation is actually uh, a, a standalone Swiss foundation now in Geneva. And they support cities around the world as they work to improve access to equitable quality cancer care. So Greater Petaling, which is really Klang Valley, uh, where you are right now, Kuala Lumpur, Petaling Jaya, Shah Alam, and many parts um, around it, is really uh, one of the cities. I'm sorry, but my slide doesn't seem to want to move. Yes. So we are one of the uh, cities and we are the ninth city. And now there are 13 cities around the world uh, aiming to improve quality care. Um, in back in 2020, uh, City Cancer Challenge received the award from the Islamic Development, Be Development Bank and International Atomic Energy Agency to strengthen multidisciplinary team care and standardization of care for breast cancer in Greater Petaling by November 2022. Um, of course, we were hit by the pandemic and hence uh, we have only been able to carry out the program um, really uh, last year. So what we have now, um, the key outputs from this study, or maybe I should introduce the project team. So the project team is made up of a multidisciplinary group of doctors uh, from the Ministry of Health, from the private sector and representing different disciplines uh, in the country. And they also represent uh, certain professional societies um, in the country. So the key outputs of this project was the documentation and dissemination of the best practices in implementing MDT for breast cancer document that has been endorsed by the Ministry of Health. And we have uh, done a few cap uh, capacity development uh, activities like we had the ESCO CCAN Multidisciplinary Cancer Management course back in September 2022. And we've conducted scientific visit to a reference center, which is the Tata Memorial Cancer Center in Mumbai. Um, and of course, we are developing capacity through ECHO, um, where I will explain it a little bit further. So we're very opportune, uh, we were very opportune to visit uh, Tata Memorial Center in February, where we visited all their different disciplines. Uh, there were about, I think, about nine of us who was there, um, ranging from surgery, radiology, and it was really nice to have this community, as you mentioned, um, of, of reaching out and understanding what we have in the region. And uh, we also, uh, as I mentioned, about to and actually doing this project where we are uh, sustaining a hub and spoke hospital model as in the ECHO. Uh, we believe in the all teach, all learn. And what we hope to sustain with this project is, of course, uh, faced um, in this year, we are building the networks between single specialty hospitals and tertiary multidisciplinary public and private hospitals that provide comprehensive cancer care through the ECHO educational MDTs. And uh, hopefully by doing this, we will create uh, structural referral networks and services um, to actually improve the MDTs in the public sector for equitable access to quality care. And also at the same time next year, we hope to build quality audits and indicators of MDT quality cancer care provision. And finally, I think implementing multidisciplinary care quality audits um, in 2025. So we have about 25 hospitals in the network of CCAN at the moment. We've just completed the needs assessment and currently uh, we're waiting for the situational report and after that we will come up with action plans and actually this MDT action plan carried out um, prematurely because of the funding that we obtained in 2020 and because of the pandemic a lot of things had been uh, delayed. Um, so we do have sustainability partners and Academy of Medicine is one of them where the College of Surgeons, Malaysia Oncology Society, College of Pathology, Radiology are all the professional societies within the Academy of Medicine. And then we have the ECHO platform. Thank you very much. I think it's a very cost-effective way of providing training and sharing. Um, we are involving all the Ministry of Health institutions, academy and private institutions in the city. And then we also have access to global partners that CCAN has, like ESCO, Tata Memorial Center. Uh, also, we have uh, connections with Breast Surgery International. This is a global uh, 
group of breast surgeons around the world. And we have also got Malaysian Society of Quality Health, where we are formally applying to incorporate the KPIs into the sixth edition of the hospital accreditation standards. So what we have done uh, this year was uh, uh, three echoes. We've started actually 12 December 2022. We had about 151 participants and we had our 15-minute talk by Professor Benjamin Anderson from the WHO uh, talking about the WHO pillars for cancer control. Um, and all this, uh, this uh, training MBTs are based on those pillars to really look into uh, how we can improve the timeliness of diagnosis uh, to 60 days, where the second one, we had a pathologist, Dr. Jane Brock, uh, who actually helped us understand a little bit about the ischemic time, cold ischemic time. And this was a very multidisciplinary group of uh, participants, ranging from oncologists, medical officers, surgeons, and so forth. And the third one was on palliative care. We had Dr. Sylvia from Hospice Malaysia who gave her, uh, her little short lecture and a case discussion. So all this um, uh, program was involving the Spoke Hospital as the case presenters and the panelists from the Hub Hospitals mentioned before. Um, and the fourth one will be coming soon on the 29th of May. Uh, and we have Dr. Rima Patak from uh, Tata Memorial Centre to tell us about the outcomes from uh, timeliness of adjuvant treatments. So just to share with you, we have another project called Rebong, which is reducing cancer early diagnosis barriers in the urban B4P. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, so uh, I, yeah, I have to, yeah, I think I'll quickly uh, wrap up. But this is a real uh, multi-sectoral, uh, multidisciplinary disciplinary type of project where we are piloting in two communities in uh, the Petaling Jaya uh, area. So we have had um, one of the projects is in here is the cancer care in primary care uh, project where we have uh, done a soft launch and we had quite a good uh, response. However, we had the, the limit of 300 participants. So thank you, Echo India, for supporting us. Now we have a thousand uh, capacity registration uh, for our Echoes that we'll be carrying out. So this project um, was carried out last year and this year. The pilot last year, uh, we only had about uh, 10 people completing, but we were really focusing on a small community in Petaling Jaya with the uh, medical officers and family medicine specialists in the community clinic in Taman Medan. The second pilot is really a larger one where we have about 92 uh, primary care doctors who is participating. So you can see a little bit of the outcomes of this, of course, from the pilot. We don't have the data from the 92 people. Uh, we hope to collect data and show the uh, effectiveness of this. And one of the things that came out from this project was our course director, uh, Associate Professor Suniza. She actually won one of the successful candidates for the leadership program for Women in Oncology, uh, um, uh, sponsored by CCAN and ESCO last year. And of course, we have a lot of public engagements with our local NGOs and of course, community navigator training uh, within the Rebong project. So we had about 20 to 28 people uh, attending this course um, in the for the small area in Tama Medan pilot that we did. So the last project we are doing uh, that will be coming soon is a professional development course for mainstreaming of genetic testing in cancer. Uh, it is in, uh, also uh, in association with a future learn online uh, uh, study, but we are using the ECHO to really help the discussions for the learners. And we will be starting a close monthly service MDT ECHO where we run a risk management and assessment clinic for genetics, uh, especially for the BRCA gene uh, pathogenic variants every month in our hospital. So that was really my last slide. So thank you very much. Sorry to take up too much time. I uh, hope to have a very good discussion later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Right. Aisha. So we'll now move to Professor Lam Chilong, who is a consultant in palliative medicine, and he will give us an update on uh, the palliative care echo.
Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share a little bit about the palliative care echo that has been going on in Malaysia since 2020. This is a joint collaborative effort between the University of Malaya, the Malaysian Hospice Council. Um, we had support from the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia as well, who helped fund um, travel and subsistence for our immersion training in India and the Ministry of Health, my counterparts there, uh, without whom uh, this project would never have launched and been where it is today. So we first came across ECHO back in 2018 where Prof Sanjeev Arora, um, a young man then, a little bit older now, came to UM in 2018 and he shared a little about Project ECHO. And at that point of time, I was the chair of the Malaysian Hospice Council and the members of the Malaysian Hospice Council, the, the hospices across the country, were very hungry for education. And we thought this was a natural platform to try and connect the um, content experts, the palliative care specialists, most of whom were in hospitals um, with the community palliative care providers um, who were reaching out pe to people in their own homes and looking after them at the end of life with cancer. So a small group of us um, went to Delhi to have immersion training there, which is the first stage of um, getting an ECHO program started. And following that, the ECHO India team were extremely helpful in supporting us as we developed a curriculum program, what we wanted to, do, to um, deliver. And uh, subsequently, they helped us soft launch the program before it went live proper. Um, this was in 20, 2020, in November 2020. This was the very first session that we had. Um, to quickly share the evaluations of how our ECHO programs have run, we, it's been running for three years now, the first one from the end of 2020 till the end of 2021. Um, we had fortnightly sessions initially, and initially we were having two case presentations at each ECHO session, but um, subsequent feedback from our participants um, suggested it needed more time for the case discussion, so there were fewer cases presented, um, but we followed the ECHO model and in total on average we were getting about 114 participants at each session, the majority of whom were nurses being doctors, um, allied health and volunteers from hospices who were interested to learn about palliative care as well. At the end of year one, we found that 84% of our participants would recommend ECHO as a useful learning tool for others, and a similar proportion also were keen to participate in ECHO programs again. Um, so following feedback from participants, we started our second year ECHO program. Um, this ran monthly instead because participants couldn't commit to two weekly sessions, um, and similarly, the, the attendance numbers were very similar. I mean, alongside that, um, the Ministry of Health domiciliary care program in the clinic Kasihatans were also keen to start launching domiciliary care programs, and they were also very hungry for information. So the Ministry of Health um, started a concurrent program uh, delivering echoes to medical assistants, family medicine specialists, and the nurses in the community as well. Um, if, if you may be unaware, um, hospices in Malaysia tend to be in the more urban areas, so the rural areas don't aren't as well connected. And in trying to reach a broader population, it, it was imperative that there was um, closer working relationships between um, the specialists and the family health specialists in the clinic Kasiatans and the hospices as well to try and deliver uh, more extensive community care. So um, at the end of the second year, we had two programs running concurrently. Uh, this year, the two programs merged. So the hospices and uh, community clinics, the Clinic Kasiatans, both uh, rest under one ECHO program and we are continuing our efforts to try and deliver education to them. So this is the range of topics we are covering this year, principles of palliative care, communication, uh, optimizing comfort and quality of life, loss and grief of grief and bereavement, as well as professional and ethical related issues pertaining to palliative care. So these sessions are running monthly. If people are interested in joining, there's a, there's a link on, on, on this slide. And um, yeah, uh, I, I think we've grown quite a bit, but I think we're continue to learn, continuing to learn quite a bit as well in, in delivering this. So I would share that our successes relatively has been very good cooperation between ourselves and the Ministry of Health and all our counterparts in the community. Um, I think we've managed to expand our spokes to include the KKs and hospices and government facilities. We sometimes have pharmacists from hospitals as well as staff from other universities joining our ECHO programs. 
um, we've been able to expand the core team uh, and that has helped with sustainability and we've been able to engage regional speakers as well. So in some instances when we haven't had the expertise locally, we've spoken to contacts in Singapore and uh, other countries uh, in, in order to support and function as content experts um, in, in topics that we may not be quite as good at and where we can learn from their expertise as well. Um, in addition, we've tried to provide linkages and support to spokes. So in, in running these ECHO programs, we've been able to link spokes with their own local specialists. And if they needed help, they could collaborate more closely together um, to support patient care in their own areas. The challenges have mainly pertained to uh, coordination and running. It does take quite a lot of manpower and effort. And I think one of the aspects which we need to work on a little bit more is uh, having 100 over spokes can sometimes be very challenging because you don't have that personal contact and that safe space with the spokes to ask um, questions which they may think are too simple for the whole group. Uh, something I was sharing with Prof Aurora earlier as well was having meaningful outcome measures in palliative care um, because we, we can't quantify HbA1c's or viral loads for hepatitis C. Uh, a lot of pal the palliative care experience and journey is about um, the experience people go through themselves, the suffering that they have, the pain they may be enduring. Sometimes it's quite hard to measure these things and we were reflecting earlier that some things are truly very difficult to measure. Uh, I, I think the other challenges to quickly share are, um, I think thus far we've not managed to get sustainable funding in order to keep our program running uh, to fund and support admin, administrative costs and coordination. And uh, the last aspect from a challenge point of view, I would say, is the it's hard catering to a very large group with different levels of expertise and I think ultimately we'll probably have to break our programs into um, different levels like basic and intermediate and advanced levels of care in order that we can cater to the needs of our participants. Uh, so before I finish, yeah, I have to really acknowledge the rest of the team, Dr. Fazlina, Dr. Xiao Yancheng, who went with me to India originally, uh, Dr. Ng Wen Fang, who's in the center there, was really keen to be here. She's the chair of the Malaysian Hospice Council now and has been really instrumental in this happening. Um, in addition, Dr. David Kapel, Dr. Lim Liak and every and uh, everyone else named and unnamed there who's involved in our ECHO. Uh, been a pleasure to work with them and to share, with, share uh, the palliative care ECHO that's happening in Malaysia today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lam. Uh, okay, so now we moved on. Uh, we move to Dr. Noor Fadlina, uh, and you come here, to, and she's a clinical oncologist, and we'll be speaking on empowering specialized cancer care in Malaysia. Thank you, everyone, for having me today. Um, I'm going to share what we do um, in Cancer Echo UM. My name is Noor Fadlina Abdul Sata or Nina Abdul. I'm a consultant oncologist um, here. So what is the uh, problem here in Malaysia? It's simple, it's disparity in specialized cancer care. We can see um, this is a map of Malaysia and the red um, stars are really chemo facilities in MOH in Malaysia. You can see that there are not that many in East Coast, namely Kelantan, Terengganu, and there are few and far in between in Sabah and Sarawak. In 2023, we have 168 oncologists. 55% of them are in private healthcare. So um, less than half are in public healthcare. According to IAEA, we need about 300 oncologists for 32 million population in Malaysia. And we are about halfway there. So this is the issue we face. And through Cancer Echo UM, what we want to do is to aim to reduce the knowledge gap and care gap in Malaysia. And how can we do this? So Cancer Echo UM is really targeted at um, junior doctors. So junior doctors on the ground looking after cancer patients throughout Malaysia. And the reality is um, they are really um, looking after uh, patients in rural or district hospitals and sometimes without easy access to uh, specialized knowledge. True story, my senior trainee told me that her sister, who is a junior doctor in Malacca, called her up on her mobile to ask about adjustment of chemo care because her sister didn't know what to do with the patient. So these are really the junior doctors we want to reach throughout Malaysia and through Cancer Echo UM. So we have a website, cancerecho.com, um, which has been established by one of our uh, trainees. So this 
Cancer EcoUM consists of a postgraduate uh, education team. Um, Prof. Marniza and I uh, went for the Cancer Echo Immersion, and then we built our team from there. We have um, IT support, we have our junior doctors, and we've come up with the uh, website. And really, we are trying to disseminate and reach out to as many junior doctors as possible to try and come with us on this journey. Um, so, who are we reaching at the moment? Under the Ministry of Education, we are the hub, which is UMMC. We also have another uh, university, which is UKM, one of our spokes, and USM um, in Penang and Kelantan. And in Ministry of Health, who's really, we are working very closely with, uh, well, also our spokes, we have General Hospital Kuala Lumpur, um, National Cancer Institute, hospital in JB, Penang, Sabah, and Sarawak. And under them, they run um, district clinics. Um, but the oncologists mainly stay at the main hospital and they do visiting clinics. So the doctors who are giving chemotherapy in this um, peripheral hospitals are mainly junior doctors under surgeons or, or under general medicine. So they need to be better linked um, and we really want to develop that special relationship with them. That's what we want to do. So total, we have 16 spokes in the public sector at the moment. Um, from January 2021 to current, we have uh, ran sessions. In 2021, we did 12 sessions and we reflected upon that and felt that to ensure that sustainability, we reduced our session to six sessions, but to end but um, we are able to deliver that year on year. You can see what we do is we really we connect with our learners and listen to feedback from our learners. So our learners tell us that they want um, guidance on radiotherapy management. We listened, we delivered. And we tapped upon content experts, not just locally, but also internationally. We have collaborated with our partners in Singapore, also in Germany, um, but mainly our uh, main experts come locally because um, they drive from what they see locally and then reflect upon that. Our trainees do case-based discussion, um, they present and then we learn from those. Collaborators include Academy uh, Medicine Malaysia, Malaysian Oncology Society that helped us disseminate these um, sessions. Um, we learn from our feedback and every session we've got feedback and really um, the feedback has been very encouraging in terms of relevant and well discussion in our case-based discussion and how they can actually apply this um, daily radiotherapy plan planning concepts from our content experts. Um, in terms of improvements, we can see that our learners are hungry for, for knowledge and tips and they do want our slides, they do want to reflect on it. So that's great and we need to reflect uh, upon timing because right now we run weekdays sort of lunchtime starting at one and some learners want it to run on weekends so we have to review back um, that. Challenges ahead is really how do we expand um, mainly to our junior doctors in uh, rural clinics, how do we sustain this project and to increase visibility for connection. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think in the interest of time, we will need to end this session. And I think... Oh, okay. So before we end, I, I was just informed that there is one cute, um, question there. Is, is there a question? I cannot see. Okay. Can you... Yeah, I think um, it's a question by um, Dr. Chen. And, and um, thanks for the inspiring talk. Are there echo programs for the care of high-risk obstetric patients in the primary care area? Um, and the answer to this is absolutely yes. We have these all over the world. They are a very popular type of echo. We also have one in, um, in New Mexico. And, and the idea here is to um, actually cover the entire, this is a big focus area for us for uh, improving the life of a woman um, from the time that um, she conceives or even prevention of pregnancy, family planning, prenatal care, making delivery safe to reduce maternal mortality, postpartum depression, and the whole sequence. 
And as you are um, correctly pointing out that high risk obstetric patients are at risk of death if you're not. And so this is an extraordinarily useful um, use of the ECHO model. And if you do have an interest, please write to us and we will connect you with teams who could help you out with that. Thank you. So I think the other question very quickly was about whether there is any uh, non-cancer related ECHO projects using the same model. Yes. And I, I think I can answer that, right? And you have the answer for the numbers? <laughs> yeah, we have about 5,000 networks of which only about uh, 175 uh, are in cancer. So everything else is covered like diabetes, hepatitis C, we have 50, mental health um, and opioid addiction. We have 1,100 networks in the world. And yes, the rheumatology and HIV, the, the pretty much um, HIV programs in Africa use the ECHO model. So there is, um, we, as I said, I think in every slide I saw sustainability. I'm still here for another three days and I would like to see in every place where ECHO has been very successful, the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Education support it. So there should be a separate line item coming from the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education to the University of Malaya for democratizing their expertise. And to the extent that I can have conversations with your government, any people, any number of meetings to convince them of the merit of setting up a dedicated FO, ECHO support office here, support of faculty time, you can have a hundred times more impact than you're currently having. As a, at the end of the day, we want to sell ECHO to the ministry as a workforce training, upskilling and mentorship tool across all their priority areas. And that is implied in that question there. Thank you. I think we all are very, and we will actually end this session. Thank you very much. Let's thank the team from the University of New Mexico in our usual manner. And thanks to all of you who've done such amazing work. It's such a pleasure and I can speak on behalf of my colleague. Uh, did you want to say uh, on, on Dr. Elizabeth Clute and I, we are so grateful for this collaboration with you. Thank you. Okay, um, the discussion session is actually another link if you are, you are interested. Uh, I have sent it to some of your, you. So we will start that in a very short while. We'll just have a, a five minute break. Thank you very much again.